I'd like to welcome you all to another lecture presented by the Green Bay Zoom class. Uh, my name is Melissa Maloney and I'll be your moderator for this evening's class. This is a school and not a church and neither are we affiliated with any religious organizations. This school is a nonprofit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization. We are dedicated to showing proof of the existence of Yahweh, our Elohim, and the operation of his eternal purpose, pattern, and plan operating throughout eternity to this present day. This school was established as a result of a divine vision and revelation given to our founder, Dr. Henry Clifford Kinley, in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. We were incorporated in the state of California in the year 1958. And since that time, we have established branch schools throughout the United States, as well as Canada, Mexico, and certain other foreign countries. This Green Bay branch was established in the year 1975. 1965, 69, excuse me. 75, yeah, okay. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you the Dean, Dr. Andy Verkaterin, and the president, Dr. Mike Josephson. In this school, we use the true, correct, and original name and title for the Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name of our Heavenly Father is Yahweh. This has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word or Son is Elohim. This has been improperly substituted by God. And the name of the Holy Spirit, whether manifested in or out of a physical body, is Yahshua. This has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Now, Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5 that there are Lord's many and God's many. But we now know that each Lord must have a name, and every God must have a name also. Now Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is the title that our Creator has chosen for Himself. Jesus is a name, but it is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into any good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that neither the Hebrew, the Greek, nor the Latin languages have any characters or letters in their alphabet that would produce the sound that is made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in our own English language until some 1400 years after the Messiah's death. Therefore, making such names as Jesus and Jehovah impossible renderings for the true, correct, and original name of our Father and His Son. Christ is a title just like Lord and God. Now, Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He is incomprehensible and inscrutable. Yahweh is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh in his pure spirit state, symbolized on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, Everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Now Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, he took on shape and he took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the word or son. A super incorporeal being, that means having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. This form could only be seen in divine vision and understood in divine revelation. Later on, this self-same spirit had manifested himself into a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah, whom the world calls Jesus Christ. 
Now there is only one name given unto salvation, and we must know that name. So the simple yet intelligent question that we should all ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior during the time that he walked the earth plane? A further understanding of this name and title may be had by reading the preface of a Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called the divine pattern because it is Yahweh, our creator's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel up out of Egypt, he called Moses to a top of Mount Sinai and showed him this tabernacle pattern in a vision. Yahweh then instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court that went round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. In this school, we will show you proof how that everything in the universe is made and operates according to the structure and function of this threefold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes this pattern. This school has 10 primary constitutional aims or objectives and they are as follows. First, to help you find and know Yahweh our Elohim as he really is and actually exists. Second, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah without distinction of race or nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third, to investigate the unexplained spirit law or so-called law of nature and the powers latent in man. Four, to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, and modern practical and occult science. Fifth, to extirpate current superstition, skepticism, and ignorance. Six, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensations and ages. Seventh, to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, the dragon, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensations of time. Eight, to earnestly contend for the common salvation and faith, which was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. Nine, to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man can be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And ten, to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of immortal glorification in the new earth state. Our watchword is peace and our slogan is speak the truth. Tonight we will have a prayer from a member from the Green Bay class, Dr. Jen Verkaterin. Our scripture reading will be Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, 31 through 35. And our uh, readers for tonight are going to be Mike Josephson and Biggie Knuth, both from the Green Bay class. Jen? Good evening, brethren. Let's take a moment and bow our hearts and minds and thank Yashua for bringing us together and ask him to give us another piece to this glorious gospel. And if we're new to this understanding and if we're questioning and wondering, let him give us that, that stability and that confidence to hold fast and know that he can provide those answers and give that assurance and, and give that peace and that rest that we need so much in this age. And these witnesses are here for us so that we can know and, and, and come to know him as he really exists. So thank you, Yashua, for all that you have given us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
The scripture reading tonight is Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, starting at verse 31. I'll be reading from a Holy Name Bible containing the Holy Name version of the Old and New Testaments, critically compared with ancient authorities and various manuscripts, revised by A.B. Trainer of the Scripture Research Association. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying know ye Yahweh for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them saith Yahweh for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more Thus saith Yahweh, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances for a, of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. Thank you so much for reading that, Dr. Mike Josephson. Tonight, I would like to welcome all returning visitors. Uh, we do encourage questions. We just ask you hold them until the end of class, and at that time, they can get addressed. Tonight, we'll be having a three-speaker format. The first is going to be a visiting branch member from Tampa, Florida. Florida, Dr. Charles Marshall, please. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I was sitting on the couch relaxing. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's just a pleasure to even be able to attend one of these classes and to learn the things that we learn here. Because when you look out in the world right now, the whole world is in turmoil from the lack of knowledge. It's crazy it's, at the thrift store today. Let's go. And especially, and especially when it comes to the religious world. So to even be able to sit here in one of these classes and learn something is uh, is just, we are very blessed. Now, uh, the scripture reading tonight, uh, could we start please right at verse 31 in uh, Jeremiah, the 31st chapter? Jeremiah oh. 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now then, uh, I did come from a Christian background. <clears throat> Matter of fact, went to quite a few ch churches before I came down here. And uh, I didn't know anything about a new covenant, an old covenant, or anything like that. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, I was brought up as what they called a New Testament Christian. We, the only reason they went back in the Old Testament was just to get some of the stories to show me how I should act and behave and so on and so forth, but really didn't know anything about it. So I didn't know anything about a new covenant. So here he's talking about he's going to make a new covenant. Now, before you can know anything about a new covenant, you've got to understand there was an old covenant and you've got to understand what that covenant was. All right. Could you read the next verse, please? 32. Sure. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. So now then here's your first clue. It's not going to be according to the covenant that he made with their fathers in the day he took and brought them out of the land of Egypt. So therefore, this to understand what the old covenant was. The first thing we need to do is we've got to we've got to go back to Egypt to Moses when the children of Israel were being brought out of bondage. 
because this is where in reality the first covenant was given and this is the first covenant that he made with the house with Israel. So before I can get into the new covenant and show you, we've got to understand something about the old covenant. <clears throat> so the old covenant was when Yahweh gave Moses. Now, see, this is also th this is how this is how important this name is, because before you. Yahweh could even establish the uh, uh, the old covenant, which was going to be the new covenant at the time, but it was it, to us today as the old covenant. He had to send Moses down into Egypt. All right. And so he had, so the first thing is he had Moses at the burning bush and he gave Moses the name of Yahweh. All right. Which the world out here is starting to use the name. You understand? Even the Catholic Church quite a few years ago. Uh, had the New Jerusalem Bible where they put the name Yahweh in there, but they still don't use it. <clears throat> Some of the world now is stating that the name is Yahweh, but they still use Lord. They use God and uh, intermingle it, not understanding that that is his name. And when he was given by Moses, uh, when he was given by Yahweh to Moses, I should say, okay, he told Moses that this is his name, and this is his name forever, and mankind has decided that that uh, they didn't either want, they, that it was too sacred to be pronounced, which they have no basis for, or they just decided that they didn't want to use it. So the first thing was he gave them the name, so that he had to go down into Egypt with that name to deliver the children of Israel from bondage. Now they were in bondage down there to Pharaoh. It's kind of like today, we're in bondage to this physical creation and to the economic and religious and the uh, uh, political world right now. We are in bondage to them and they are in darkness. And we're trying to deliver them out of this darkness by preaching these names and teaching these names and showing that there was an old covenant and that there is a new covenant. So he went down with that name, Yahweh, to deliver the children of Israel. Now that's important because right from the start, when he gave the children of Israel that name, he was showing forth that that name Yahweh is salvation because he went down there with that name. He declared that name to Pharaoh, which Pharaoh said he didn't know this God or that name. And he, de he declared that name to the children of Israel and to the Egyptians down there at the same time. And therefore showing that that name Yahweh is salvation, that they were going to deliver them from that by that name. See, that's just all things that we can apply today. That's the reason I'm bringing these things up. Brings the children of Israel out of bondage. And as we've all, uh, as you've been told and probably have heard, came through, delivered them from bondage with death, burial, resurrection, death of the lamb. Okay, which is a representing or showing forth Yahshua, death, buried, they were buried in the Red Sea, you see, death, burial, and they resurrected on the other side and sang a song of victory. Then they had to go up to the mountain where Yahweh was to speak from to them from that mountain. Now, this is this is Yahweh giving them the commandments, or this is establishing, if you will, the old covenant. He spoke to them. Now, this is like a marriage ceremony, if you will, because Yahweh said that he would be their husband and that he would provide for them. Their shoes would not wear out. He provided manna for them to eat. He was a husband unto them. And they said, everything that Yahweh says we will do, I do. In other words, they accepted and it was like a marriage to, to Yahweh. So Yahweh... Now, showing forth right from the very beginning here, okay, that the, that the old co that there was an old covenant. He spoke it. Moses went up with a stone. Uh, Moses went up, and Yahweh had stones up there and wrote the Ten Commandments on those stones. Now Moses came down from that mountain, and the seventy elders that went up there with him when he first went up. They got tired of waiting for him, thought he was probably killed in that mountain because of all the lightning and the thundering and everything that was going and the fire that was going on up there. 
they decided that they would leave and they build a golden calf. The first commandment, you see, don't build, don't have any other El Elohim or gods, if you will, I'll say it that way, or Elohims before him. And the first, that's the first commandment. That's the first thing they broke of the covenant already. Moses came down from that mountain with the tables of stone. And he was angry seeing that they were being idolaters. And he broke that first set of stones. Okay. Now this is showing forth that first set, uh, covenant or that first set of stones you see would be broken because the children of Israel could not keep them commandments they broke the first one right away so then Moses went back up the mountain took a set of stones with him showing forth like his own heart now I was I was taught basically that the Ten Commandments was written on it was like a tombstone but in actual reality, you see, it was in more of a shape of a heart because this is showing forth our heart. You, Moses took up a, that sandstone up with him, you see, to show forth it was his heart and Yahweh wrote within it. That's showing forth the new covenant. See, even back here, Yahweh was setting it up and showing mankind what he was going to do and foretelling everything in the future like he always does, you understand? And showing that they wouldn't keep it. So he wrote that in that set of stones and brought it down. Now, as you've probably been told, Moses, when he was up on that mountain, was also given, this was the, the trip before he took his stone up, was given the, the tabernacle pattern, uh, the plan and for the tabernacle pattern. And that was to show forth, you see, it's a type of, if you will, Yahshua laying down his life or or that being put or that that is also representation of us you see because we you've probably been showing how that your body and the tabernacle are the same or in other words you're made in the image and the likeness of your creator that first set of stones did not get in that tabernacle it was the second set of stones showing forth that that first covenant would not get in the people and without that getting in the people, you see, they could not keep it. So therefore, showing forth that Moses went up and Yahweh had to carve in Moses's heart, if you will, a type and a shadow of carving in Moses's heart so that that would get in the tabernacle, showing that it would be the second, the, the new covenant or the second covenant, you see, that was going to actually get in the people. So I wanted to set all that up because this all helps understand a little bit more about what was going on and what Yahweh was doing to set these things up. And to, see, now I was not I was not encouraged to read the Old Testament. I was told I was a New Testament Christian. Everything I needed to know was in the New Testament. Now, had I been taught these things back in the Old Covenant, you understand, and understanding the old covenant, then I would understand that there was a new covenant and had the understanding of that new covenant. Now you will too, you see that Yahweh, when he took and he made that covenant with the children of Israel back there, and I told you before that this was like a marriage ceremony. He was their husband and they were his bride. Now in the, in the, uh, in the old covenant, we can uh, we can get I think it's in uh, it's uh, where if the woman makes the vow I think that's uh, a numbers. numbers yeah where if the woman makes the vow I'm going to try to set this up so that uh, somebody can take off and go with it and uh, try to get all these things here to try to set this up to give us an understanding of why what's going on and why okay could you read that please. Numbers 30, you want me to pick it up at 8? Okay, that sounds good. I haven't got it, but okay, I'll look here. One ahead. I'll pick up at 7. Okay. Or 6, I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. I, I just don't know where to even start. Just pick it up. <laughs> 6. Okay. And if she had at all a husband when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her in the day that she that he heard it. Then her vows shall stand in her bond. Now then, 
Okay, well, finish that uh, that verse then. Her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. So here is Yahweh. He is speaking, that, like I said, this is like a marriage. Yahweh is speaking down to the people. They heard this, but because it, the, it shook and it rattled and it, it was loud, they said, please don't have him speak to us anymore. You see, but they said, I do. So this is Yah. This is <clears throat> get me some water, please. This is Yahweh <clears throat> speaking down to the children of Israel, and this is like a marriage ceremony. He, this is his bride. All right. Now he knows he knows that they're not going to be able to keep this this covenant, but he didn't say anything. He kept his mouth shut. So Israel has said, "I do." This is the bride. Now read on. But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow, which she vowed, that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul of none effect. So see, if he by him keeping his mouth shut, that means that he now is going to have to keep that covenant and it in other words, it's it's it's. I'll, I'll break it down in in terms like this. Let's say my wife decided she was going to buy a car, and I and I said, okay, you know, didn't say anything, even though I knew that I was going to have to end up paying for it because I knew that she wasn't making enough money to really pay for that car. So therefore, when she could not make the payments anymore, I would step in. I would have to step in, even according to law, I would have to step in. And I would have to make those payments. Now, if I'd have told her right away, Jennifer, really, you can't, you can't afford that car. You know, it, it's going to be too much for you. You see, then, then that's one thing. But see, if she goes on ahead, you know, see, and I, and I don't say anything, which Yahweh didn't say, didn't say anything, then I'm going to have to come in and do it. Read on, please. Um, I'll pick it up at nine. But every vow of a widow and and of her that is divorced, wherewith they have bound their souls, shall stand against her. Okay, we'll just we'll end it there, Mike. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. So so here we have Yahweh, a marriage ceremony, stating down, Israel says, I do. Yahweh knew that they couldn't keep it. So then therefore he's gonna have to come in and he's going to have to keep all those commandments. And that's what yeah, when Yahshua was telling, okay, that that uh, he was gonna ha that he didn't come to institute. You see, he came in to fulfill. So what he did is he took on shape and form, okay, came down amongst men, walked among us. You understand, and fulfilled or did all the things that was back there in the law and the prophets. Now, I just said one minor thing about how he was the lamb and showing forth how he was the lamb back there. So he, one of the things that he came in was he came in to fulfill that lamb or that sacrifice. And all those commandments, like the circumcision, the ceremonies, you see, all of those things that was back there, the baptism, all of that that was back there that they had to do under that old covenant. Now, these were things that was under the old covenant, okay? The the the, uh, the circumcision, the uh, the ceremonies, okay? The, the suppers, the sacrifices, and all the ordinances. And there were 600, there wasn't just 10, there were 613 ordinances back there that they had to, that they had to do and keep. So he came in to fulfill. Now, he knew that they could not keep these commandments. So therefore, as it talks about in Revelation, you see, Yash Yahweh or Yahshua, you see, was the lamb from the foundation of the world. So right from the very, very beginning, right from the foundation of the world, Yahweh had his plan and purpose, knew how it was going to work out, you understand, and carried it forth. So Yahshua came in. And he fulfilled all those things that was written back there in the Old Testament. And that's why in this class, we go back into the Old Testament all the time, showing forth how the, the law and the prophets, you understand, the first five books, the law, uh, the law 
and the and the rest from uh, uh, Joshua to Malachi. You understand? That's the prophets. So that them are the books that are testifying of him. Remember these. When I was in Christianity, it was I was a New Testament Christian, but yet when Yahshua was walking around the Palestinian hills, and even some, uh, I think it's like about 60 some years after his death, his burial, and his resurrection, the first letter, if you will, or the first New Testament was written. So therefore, it, he could, even the apostles couldn't walk around and talk about Yahshua you see, using the New Testament because it wasn't written yet. I didn't know these things before I came down here. You understand? So there's, it's no wonder I didn't know anything about my creator and about my savior because I didn't know anything about the Old Testament and what the Old Testament was trying to do. And I thought, you see, going to church and going to study school, that, that Jesus had came in and instituted when in actual reality, he came in and he fulfilled. Could you get that for me? Where he says that he came in to fulfill, what is it, Matthew? Matthew 5, 17. Yep. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So here, see, and I, well, I thought I knew something about the New Testament before I came down here, and I didn't even know about that. You understand? It's amazing how ignorant we can be. We can go to uh, Sunday school and church all these years and then come down here and find out just exactly how ignorant we were. So here he, I thought, and I was told that he came in to institute a Christian way of life. And here is Joshua saying that he came in to fulfill exactly what I was talking about. Everything he did when he walked around the Palestinian hills was to fill that Old Testament. Now, also under the law, that if a man married a woman, all right, and, and he died, okay, she was free to remarry, all right? So he come in, he was the husband, he come in, he died. So that loosed Israel, that loosed everyone, that... It, it, Look, that law was given to Israel and to Israel alone. There was no Gentiles, okay? It was all Jews that were back there. And if any of the Egyptians was to come out of Egypt with them, they had to be circumcised and be go through the rituals and be cleansed for Judaism. So the, everybody that was back there was Jews. That law was given to the Jews and to the Jews only. It wasn't given to me even though I was taught it was given to me. So Yahshua comes in, being the husband. He fulfilled. He took the obligation. He did the obligation for his bride because he knew that they couldn't do that. So he comes in. He gets on the cross, you understand, and he dies on that cross. So that meant that Israel was no longer under that law. Okay? So now then, could we go back to Jeremiah 31, 31? And can we start at uh, verse 32 again, please, if you could, Mike? Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. So see here, I, what I'm trying to do is show you how he was their husband. Now, here's the thing of it. The first sentence in verse 32 says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day. So therefore, the new covenant is not going to be like the old covenant. That's number one. And what I was taught when I was going to church, you understand, was that it was... I thought it, it, I thought both I didn't I didn't know there was a, a difference. Matter of fact, I didn't even know anything of really truly about the first covenant. So I everything to me was just like I had rules, I had regulations. All right? There were ceremonies. That's why you had to go to church. 
Okay, the priest wore garb. You know, uh, even the, even your Protestant preach uh, preachers a lot of times would would they especially back in the old days used to wear you know garbs and stuff like that, even though they were just Protestants. So there were ceremonies and there were certain things. Okay, they had baptisms. I was baptized. I I, I as I said I was baptized. I went in the water. I was I was I was. They put me in the water and I came out of the water. I was wet, but I was still ignorant. I still didn't know a thing about my creator. As a matter of fact, they told me that they were baptizing me in the name of in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And not one time did they tell me what the name of the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit was. So I was baptized. I would eat communion, okay? On Sundays when I'd go to church, you know, they'd pass out uh, crackers and grape juice, which was which is a type and a shadow and of uh, of the Passover. Joshua ate the Passover. They 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 the in the Bible they call it the Last Supper, but it has come out to be the everlasting supper. So I would eat that. You understand? And I would uh, sacrifices. Well, we didn't we didn't sacrifice our animals. Although I grew up on a small farm, we had we had animals. We didn't sacrifice the animals. They wanted our money, so we sacrificed our bucks and our does, if you will. You see, giving them towards this towards. Could you go back to uh, Yahshua on the cross there, please? Appreciate it. Thank you. So the, 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 so I would sacrifice. Okay. And then the ordinances. Oh yeah, the ordinances. Boy, oh boy, they they pound that Ten Commandment morality and that Ten Commandments in me. Okay, I didn't know about I didn't know about the six hundred and thirteen other ones. They didn't. I've never heard about them until like uh, the six the six hundred and three. I'm sorry. Uh, only ones I heard about was the the ten, and they pounded them into me that I didn't understand that. As it's saying right here on this on this chart that that was nailed to the cross, all of them ordinances. Now these ordinances was giving to carnal minds. Yahweh had not poured out His Spirit on mankind yet, and all these ordinances they were natural, they were physical, they were earthly, they they were temporary. You understand? Now remember, the new covenant is not going to be like the old covenant. All right. Now. They don't practice really circumcision anymore, if you, you will, for religion, except the uh, the Jews, of course, still do, and Muslims, and so on and so forth. But as far as Christianity, because it comes right out the New Testament and talks about how the circumcision is going to be of the heart and going to be of the mind. So therefore, you see, they don't, it just comes right out and says it. So they don't do the circumcision. But the New Testament, seeing that the Old Testament is fulfilled, now the New Testament is going to be written in your heart and in your mind. Just like when Moses, you see, came down with the first set of stones representing the Old Covenant, he broke those because the children of Israel could not keep those. It's showing forth that those ordinances would be broken. So this is important. When Moses went back up, he took a set of he took the set of stones back up with him, showing forth it's his heart. So he goes up to the mountain, and Yahweh writes in those, and he comes down, and those set that set of stones gets put in the tabernacle, which is a, showing forth a type and a shadow of you. So that's him putting his spirit within you. Now the the Ten Commandment was put in the most holy place, you see, under the Ark of the Covenant there, under the archangels, okay, showing forth that that new covenant or that new set of stones would be put within your heart and in your mind because they were in the shape of a heart and representing the most holy place, representing the, the, the head cavity, showing forth it would be put within you, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, could you read verse 33, please, in Jeremiah? But this uh, shall be the covenant. Thank you. This shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahweh. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Okay, I'm going to have to, I haven't got time to get where I was going to go, but I'll just put this, okay? It says, I, 
Okay, this is important here. In verse 33, he says, I, Yahweh, I will put my law in their inward parts, and he's going to write it in their hearts, and he will be our Elohim, and we, or they, shall be his people. So it's Yahweh, after he went through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you see, on the day of Pentecost, he poured out the, the disciples and 120 people were up gathered up into the upper room and he poured out his spirit up on them, all right, or put his spirit within them. He then wrote his laws, you will, in them. That's what we come to class for. We're learning of Yahweh. We're learning of what he is, how he is doing things in this age and dispensation. And now then, you see, I don't have to, I don't have to go around telling you what to do, what not to do. Yahweh, if the Holy Spirit be in you, he will guide you. Now, this is a learning experience. We're, we're not perfect. We're not, we're still learning, but I'm telling you right now, when I do something that I realize that, that is not, it, it, I'll put it like this. It bothers my conscience. Yahweh lets me know about it. Nobody has to tell me. Nobody has to, you know, pound uh, Ten Commandment morality in me or anything. When you come into this class, he changes you. He will change your heart. He will change your mind. He will change the way that you think, the way that you do things. And it's Yahweh doing it. It's not me. It's not you. It's Yahweh. He's the one that's doing all this. In the old, under the old covenant, it's you had to do this, you had to do that. Under the new covenant, it's Yahweh doing it all for you. And with that, I thank you very much for the time. I hope somebody got a little something out of that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Charles Marshall. And our second speaker this evening will be the Dean of Green Bay, Class, Dr. Andy Verkaterin, please. Hello, everybody. And, Hello. Uh, Hello. It's uh, good for everyone to be here. Um, this is an incredible teaching, if you really think about it. What I'm going to do is just go back over some of the things that Chuck was talking about. He was talking about a covenant. And I'll just tell you where I was. When I came to class, I came in here to save my brother. I was raised Catholic, and then my parents went through divorce, and then I ended up going to my grandma's Lutheran church, and then I ended up as a teenager being confirmed Methodist, and my brother was in this teaching, and my parents told me to go see what this is all about, and that was 40, almost 45 years ago, and I'm still here because this teaching just, just shocked me. I've never heard anything like it. I uh, never heard the name Yahweh before I came here, never heard the name Yahshua, and I didn't know what a covenant was. Um, I mean, covenant's not a word that I used in my grammar, you know, but what a covenant is, if you look the word up, it's a mutual agreement between two or more parties. In other words, a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. Now, if I marry my wife, that covenant, marriage covenant I have is with my wife, and it's not with another lady besides her, and nor is it another man besides me. It's a covenant between me and my wife, and it's a mutual agreement. I agree to take her as my wife. She agrees to take me as her husband, and, you know, the death to you part, you know through sickness and health. Now back there, Chuck was talking about how when a woman uh, vows a vow and his husband holds his peace, that he has to bear the iniquity of that woman. Let's go to the scripture reading. Let's just establish a fact clear. we we'll take a time because some of these things I understand are not things that are commonly taught in the world, but we're gonna pull it right out of the book. Get, let's get the scripture reading, please. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
Now, first of all, he says, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the Baptists and the Methodists and no. all the Catholics. No, he doesn't say that. He says he's going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, who the heck is the house of Israel? See, I didn't know anything about the house of Israel before I came to class. The house of Israel is back there at the time of Moses. If you, Moses was a Levite. And if you go back through his lineage, you're going to find out that Abraham had Isaac and then Isaac had uh, uh, Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And, J and Jacob had 12 sons. You might have heard of Joseph, the coat of many colors. That would be an example of one of Jacob's sons. And he was sold into uh, slavery down there in Egypt. But but Jacob had 12 sons. And he's showing them on the map right here. You have on the top left corner, you have Benjamin. Then you have dropping down Gad, Reuben, Simeon, Zebulun, Judah. And, you know, you heard the house of Judah. And then Issachar, you have Nephtali, Dan, and Asher. And then you have Ephraim and Manasseh. But Ephraim and Manasseh are really the sons of Joseph, which was one. And then you have Levi going around the tabernacle. Those would be the 12 sons. Levi and Joseph uh, would be uh, the 12 and not Ephraim and Manasseh. Because Ephraim and Manasseh are actually Joseph's two sons. Now, that is a covenant that Yahweh made with them. And you don't see any Baptists on any of the tents yet or any, uh, any Christians down there. You know, they just, it wasn't with them. Now, behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. That's the house of Israel. We just went through it. That Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That is the house that he's talking about. Read. 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which now, what he's talking about here is there was a time that this house of Israel was in Egypt. And Yahweh took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. He took them and they worshiped Yahweh around the mountain in these 12 tribes. He's going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like the one that I made with them in the day that I took them out of the land of Egypt. So it's real specific of what time frame we're talking about here. Read. Which my covenant they break, although I was mm -hmm. a husband unto them, saith Yahweh. He, they broke his covenant, but Yahweh said he was a what to them? A husband. The creator of the universe referred to himself as a husband to the children of Israel. So that would make the children of Israel his bride. Now, if a woman vows a vow in the house and her husband, which is Yahweh in this case, holds his peace, then all her vows shall stand. Well, I mean, uh, and I'm, I'm butchering it. Let's get back the numbers there and let's go to uh, where he shall bear her iniquity. In Numbers 30. Pardon? You know exactly where to start, Andy? 30 and 15. Okay. But he shall in any ways make them void after that he heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. So if he doesn't make... In other words, if he says, Israel, I know you have vowed a vow to me, but you can't keep it. But if he would have said that you can't do it, then, then you know, it would have made the covenant of no effect. But because Yahweh held his peace and he didn't make it void, that means Yahweh himself is going to have to bear the iniquity for the children of Israel for breaking that vow. Now, now let's go back to the scripture reading where you left off. I just wanted to establish that Yahweh's the husband in this case, and Israel is bride. Now, remember, this is a covenant between the husband and a wife. It's not a covenant against other. No one else was there. They weren't allowed there. It wasn't a covenant open to the world. I don't open my marriage up to my neighbors. 
No more than this is a covenant with anyone but Yahweh and Israel. It's just Let's get Deuteronomy 625 first. I gotta bring this into the picture. Deuteronomy 625. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before Yahweh our Elohim, as he had commanded us. Now back there, it would be their righteousness. Israel, when they agreed to that law, it would be their righteousness. If they could give it a good shot, is that what you just read? No. Read it again. You do all these commandments. All. Not some, not most. All. In other words, you had to keep the whole 613 of them. And here we are trying to just keep 10. We don't even know about the other 603. But you had to keep them all. Now, what was Israel's problem back there? Get Deuteronomy 6, 20, no, uh, 5, um, oh, 5 and 39, I think it is. There was such a heart in them. 529. Deuteronomy? Yes. Oh, oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. That it means See, back might there, Yahweh knew that Israel didn't have the heart in them as a people to be able to keep all the commandments, even though it would be their all right, all their righteousness, if they could keep it all. As a matter of fact, under the law, that there's a some information in the law about blessing and about curses. Now, if you were able to keep the law, it would be a blessing unto you. And if you weren't able to keep the law, it would be a curse unto you. So in other words, it was blessing and curses based on whether or not the children of Israel would be able to keep that law or not. Now, um, now let's go back to where you left off, Mike and James. James, James 2 and 10. 2 and 10 again. Mm -hmm. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. So in other words, if you try to keep it all, and you just are guilty in just one point, just one, you did 612 out of 613, just one, according to this, you're still guilty of them all. Why? Because the, co the covenant was all. And Yahweh knew that they couldn't keep it all. They didn't have the heart in them to keep it all. 
And they were under the curse. And Yahweh has to end that covenant because they broke that covenant. So Yahweh said he was going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of uh, Judah. And it's not going to be like the one that he made with them back there. You know, so, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Now, if you had attended any other classes, you would know that when you look at um, the Moses chart, and we work with the breakdown of supernal nature, we talk about what Yahweh is. Yahweh is the Father. And he is pure spirit abstract, which would be represented as the cloud. Now, Yahweh took on shape and form right within himself as that visionary shape and form, which we refer to as Yahweh Elohim. That is Yahweh as Elohim. That's not a different Elohim besides him. He's, there's no Elohim besides him. He's it. That is Yahweh right there in a visionary shape and form as Yahweh Elohim. Now, he appeared to all the prophets, and it was him. That Yahweh Elohim that was speaking from the top of that mountain. And that Yahweh Elohim held his peace. Now, we also know that Yahweh Elohim is the word. And if you've attended any classes and people have gotten into John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word. And this word was with Yahweh. And this word was Yahweh. We also know that this word was made flesh and dwelt among them. Let's go to John 1 and 1 because I just want to tie this point up here. And then we're going to go back to the idea of a husband and why Yahshua has to be the one to fulfill that law, why Yahshua has to be the one to take that covenant away, to, to end it. Get John 1 and 1. John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with Yahweh, and the word was Yahweh. Now, in the beginning was the word. Now, this word was a visionary shape and form. That was Yahweh, that in the beginning was the word, the word is with Yahweh, and this word was Yahweh. See, some people talk about the Bible as being the word of God. No, the Bible is not the word of God, because the Bible didn't come to Abraham in a vision saying something. The Bible wasn't even written at the time of Abraham. The, Bible, the word did not come to Jeremiah. The word, it, you know, it wasn't the Bible. It was it was the word. It was that visionary shape and form of Yahweh, also known as Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh Elohim, Elohim and the word are just both titles. They're just titles trying to express that visionary shape and form, that super incorporeal form of Yahweh that he uses to communicate to man. Now, in the beginning was the word, the word was with Yahweh, this word was Yahweh. The same was in the beginning with Yahweh. Read. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Right. In Indeed. him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, this life that was in Yahweh Elohim, or the word, was also the light of men. Read. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Mm -hmm. There was a man sent from Yahweh whose name was John. Now, we just got done talking about how the word was the light, and it was the light of men. Now, there was a man sent of Yah, and his, and his name was John. He's talking about John the Baptist. That, read verse 7. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. He bore all... witness of the light, which is the word that was Yahweh. That's when Yahshua came up to John to be baptized. And, and John said, behold, the Lamb of Yahweh, which does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Because he's got to fulfill that covenant. He's the, he's the word made flesh. And, you know, and we could keep going or keep, keep reading there. Verse 7. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men mm -hmm. through him might believe. Mm -hmm. He was not that talking about Yahshua. Read. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Right. Because John Baptist was to bear witness of that light, which is Yahweh Elohim, or the word made flesh, or Yahshua in reality. Read. 
That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He mm -hmm. was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Yep, and they didn't know who Yahshua was. They wouldn't have put him on the cross if they would have known that was God in a body. Now, we go down to John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Yahshua is the word made flesh. And he's the one that held his peace. So he has to, as the husband, that's how Yahshua is the husband of the church. A church means assembly. He's the husband of the body. So he has to bear the iniquity of that covenant. Now, just let's just let's just prove this a little deeper. Uh, let's get um, um, Galatians 4 and 4. And then we'll get Galatians 3, 10 through 13. Galatians 4 and 4. Mm -hmm. But when the fullness of the time was come, Yahweh sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. Now when the fullness of the time has come, Yahweh sent forth his son, talking about Yahshua, made of a woman made under the law. What law is he talking about? He's talking about that law that was still going on, that agreement, that covenant, that 613 ordinances that Israel committed themselves to was still going on. So Yahshua has to come in and end that. So when the fullness of time was come, Yahshua was made of a woman through the loins of the Virgin Mary, made under the law. Read. To redeem them, redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So he came in to redeem them that were under the law. What does the word redeem mean? It means to pay the price or to buy back. In other words, it's to, you're redeeming them that were under that law because there was a problem. They weren't able to keep it. So Yahshua has to redeem them that were under that law. Now let's get Galatians 3 and verse 10 through 13, which I called for. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which were written in the book of the law to do them. Now, then we just get how if you offend in one point, you're guilty of them all. So here it's talking about the curse of the law. And if you, uh, uh, you have to keep it all, basically it's saying it again. So what we're talking about is in the book in many places. We can, we can try to explain this in many, many different ways all these things that we have. There's a lot of places we can go to try to make our points, but go ahead and keep reading. 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Mm -hmm. And the law no is man not... Is justified by the law because everyone fell short. No one was able to keep it. No one was able to keep it all. Read. Um... And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Mm -hmm. Yahshua has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Did you ever us. ask your priest why Yahshua had to be the one to redeem you? Because Yahshua was the husband that held his peace back there. That's why he's the one that has to redeem them. Yahshua has redeemed us from the curse of the law. What curse? That was a blessing if they could keep it, and it was a curse if they couldn't. So Yahshua redeemed us from the curse of the law. Read. Um, Yahshua redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is mm -hmm. written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Mm -hmm. That the blessing That's good enough there. That's good enough there. So basically, I'm just trying to show you how Yahshua is playing the role here of the husband and he has to be the one to come in and fulfill that law. Now, there was all kinds of things under that law. You know, uh, for example, like, um, um, and I, I don't want to pick on any specific church or anything like that, but one of the religions I started out with was the uh, Catholics. Excuse me. Now, Catholics, they have what they call sacraments. Let's get, uh, do you have a Baltimore Catechism, Mike or Gail? Yeah. 
Would you be able to get sacraments in the Baltimore Catechism? Now, what a Baltimore Catechism is, it's like a, a book that you use in your catechism classes. It's basically their do doctrine, and it's imprimatur by um, someone in the clergy, upper, upper ranks of the clergy. But it's a Baltimore Catechism. It's a question and answer type of thing. Uh, what do you have? What is a sacrament? Okay. That's question 574. What is a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Now here they say a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Now here's my question. What does the word institute mean? Start. You look up the word institute. What is the definition of the word institute? Start. start. Begin. It's to start, to begin, to set it up. So, in other words, they're saying that Christ or Yahshua instituted these sacraments. He set them up. He started these sacraments. Now, what are these sacraments? What's the first one they say? Uh, how many sacraments are there? There are mm -hmm. seven sacraments. Baptism? Baptism? They're saying that Christ instituted baptism. Read. Confirmation. Holy Confirmation. Okay. Read. Holy Eucharist. Well, in other words, eating of the Lord's Supper or eating of that wafer and that wine. Read. Penance. Penance. Extreme unction. Anointings. Holy orders. Holy orders. And matrimony. And matrimony. Now, didn't we already establish that there was already a marriage instituted with the children of Israel back under the old covenant? Didn't he always say he was a husband? So how could Christ institute matrimony that has already been going on? Hmm. How could he start it? He can't because it's already been started. You can't go out and start a car and then go out and start it again. You could wreck your starter, but you can turn it off. And the marriage was already instituted with the creator in Israel. So Yahshua didn't come to restart it. He came to fulfill it, which means to end it, to bring it to an end. Uh, let's, let's get, um, um, well, we'll get the next one. Um, we just hit the marriage one. Let's see it. Let's let's get baptism. They say that Christ instituted baptism. And if you look up baptism in their sacrament, they say very when did when did uh baptism get instituted? They say their answer is very probably about the time he was baptized by John the Baptist. That's exactly what it says. That's very exactly what it says. Okay, now let's just go to the baptism. Uh, let's just see what happens here. Let's go what to is, Matthew 3.11. Remember, John is the one that pointed Joshua out. Wasn't he the one that was bearing witness to the light? What was the word made flesh? It was Joshua was pointed out as being that light of the world. But go ahead and read Matthew. Matthew 3.11. Mm -hmm. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But now he here's John the Baptist saying, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, right? So right. what are they repenting of? They're repenting of not being able to keep that law that they committed themselves for hundreds of years ago. They weren't able to keep it all. So they were repentant and they were being baptized for that reason. So then John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, read. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose mm -hmm. shoes I am not worthy to bear. Whose shoes shall I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mm -hmm. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will okay, burn up down to where he's going to be baptized. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. Now but here John comes Yahshua 
in the Jordan to John to be baptized. Now remember, this is a baptism of repentance, right? Right. Read. 14, but John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou so to me? The first question is, why would John say that? Because the first thing John would have said, are you a sinner? And if they would have said yes, then John would have put him in the Jordan River. But when Yahshua comes to him, Yahshua can't say he's a sinner because he didn't sin. So that's why John said, then I have need to be baptized of thee, and you're coming to me? That's why he said that, because Yahshua was not a sinner. But what does Yahshua say? And Yahshua answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus Suffer it becometh be us. So now. Do it anyway, John. Why? It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Because we got to start this water baptism thing. That's not what he says. He says we have to fulfill it. The word fulfill means to complete it, to bring it to an end, to bring it to its completion. How could Jesus institute water baptism? Wasn't John already baptizing? Think about that. Just think right. about the idea. John is already baptizing. How could Jesus start water baptism if John's already baptizing? Just think about that. Either he instituted or he didn't. Yahshua says he came to fulfill it, not institute it. Now, all these religions out here believe that Jesus instituted baptism. But he didn't. He couldn't have. Now, let's just examine this a little closer. Now, when did this baptizing start? If you're back there under the law, one of the other sacraments was holy orders. Now, how could Jesus institute holy orders when they already had Leviticus priesthood? That was a holy order. They were holy priesthood. That was a, they had holy garments. Holy orders was already instituted way back there at the time of, of Moses. So we can't institute holy orders either because holy orders were already going on. But when that high priest had to serve in office, he had to be anointed. Now, isn't one of the uh, sacraments extreme unction or anointing? Mm -hmm. The high priest had to be anointed. So again, Yahshua can't institute anointing. He can't institute uh, holy orders. He can't institute matrimony. And he can't institute baptism because they're already all going on. Now that priest, see that labor he's circling there? That high priest at the age of 30 had to serve in his office from the age of 30 until he was 50. He had to be anointed. He had to be consecrated. He had to be washed in that labor at the age of 30. And he had to be washed by a Levite. It was Moses that washed Aaron, and it had to be a Levite that washed these priests in the labor. Now, John the Baptist, when Yahshua came to fulfill this, John the Baptist is a Levite. Now, isn't a Levite washing Yahshua is being baptized by a Levite? Why? To institute it? No, to fulfill it, because Levites were already being baptized or baptizing back there. And at the age of 30, see, when I was raised as a Catholic, I was baptized when I was a little baby. They weren't baptizing babies back here. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where you baptize babies. How old was Joshua when he was baptized? That priest had to be 30, right? Let's go to Luke um, uh, 3 and 23. Luke 3 and 23. And Yahshua himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed the son of Joseph. See, when he went to be baptized, I do see it. He was 30 years of age. Were you 30 when you were baptized? If Jesus is instituting it, wouldn't you have to be 30 as well? You would think so. Wouldn't you have to be baptized by a Levite? Heck, I didn't even know what a Levite was when I came to class. But Yahshua's fulfilling that priest back there had to be washed by a Levite at the age of 30. So John the Baptist is baptizing Yahshua, and Yahshua says, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becomes, thus fulfill all righteousness. Yahshua has to redeem them. 
he has to complete all, all of that law. He has to keep it all. And Yash was the only one that could keep it all. Everyone else couldn't keep it. Now, another one of the things is extreme unction, or, or not extreme unction, um, the Eucharist, where they, the eating of the Passover. Now, let's get... Um, um, Matthew 26 and 26. And then I also want to go to um, Luke 22 and 1 and Luke 22 and 19. Matthew 26 and 26. Now this is Matthew's account of the eating of the Last Supper that Chuck Marshall was talking about. Now let's just watch what's happening here. And as they were eating, Yahshua took bread and blessed it. Whoa, and whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute, stop. What? As they were what? Eating. What do you mean they're eating? He didn't even say do this in remembrance. I mean, they're already eating. How could he institute keeping a Passover when they're already eating the Passover? He didn't even say anything yet. As they were eating, read. He took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. Drink for this is, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Yahshua has to be the one to take away the remission of sins. So he can't institute Lord's suppers because they're already eating it before he even has a chance to tell them to do it in remembrance of me, right? Now let's get the Luke, the Luke that I called for. Luke 22 and 1. Uh -huh. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which was called the Passover. Now, first of all, before we leave that scripture, where was the Passover instituted? Way back there at the time of Moses. Remember when Egypt, when the slaves, the children of Israel were in bondage to Israel? They were slaves. The last plague was called the death of the firstborn. And that's when they had to take out a lamb and they had to put the blood around the door and they had to eat that lamb and they couldn't let nothing remain till the morning. And that lamb, all the principles of that lamb is pointing out Yahshua. That Passover back there, let's get Exodus 12 where it said we keep it as a memorial. Exodus 12 and 11. Twelve and eleven, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. See, this Passover was set up many fifteen hundred years before Yahshua comes on the scene. So Yahshua can't institute Holy Eucharist. So when he says in Luke twenty-two and verse, what did I call for? Verse nineteen. What yep. does he say to his apostles during the Passover? And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, why does Joshua have to tell his 12 disciples to do this in remembrance of him? Because when the Passover was set up, the same creator told Israel, to do this as a memorial unto all your generations. And there was 12 tribes of Israel. So when Yahshua comes in, he has to keep the Passover with Israelites. There was no Gentiles, meaning everyone that was at the Passover was no, there was no Christians at the Passover. They were all Israelites. And they kept the Passover because they were being obedient to the law that was already set up, already instituted. So Yahshua says, do this in remembrance of me with the 12 in fulfillment of Yahweh saying, keep this as a memorial to the 12 tribes. See, Yahshua can't institute anything. He's fulfilling. Everything he's fulfilling, he's redeeming them that were under the law. So he could bring in a new covenant, a new way of worship. And then um, 
I'm out of time, but hopefully you got something out of it. There's so much more we could say. We just, you know, we just do the best we can in a little bit of time we have. And hopefully something I said caught your attention or at least provoked the question because we love questions down here. We'd be happy to answer them. I'll turn it back to the moderator. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andy Verkaterin. And our last speaker this evening will be the Dean of Oceanside, California, Dr. Dennis Volpe, please. I wanna say good evening to everyone. And Hello. I trust that you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. You know, the first two speakers really covered a lot of ground and brought out a lot of things. And all I can do is try to add some things to what they were saying. Now, let me start by saying this. No matter what type of worship people do in the world, if it is not founded upon Yahweh's purpose and plan or what Yahweh has intended, then it is a man-made concept or form of worship that may in fact not be what Yahweh is seeking. Now I want to have you start by going to John, the fourth chapter, starting around verse 23. And I want you to, yeah, go ahead and read that. We'll read 23 and 24. And while they're getting that, let me set it up. Yahshua spoke to a woman that was a Samaritan woman uh, who was an Israelite and was at the well that Jacob had uh, set up. And Yahshua asked her for a drink of water. And she was surprised because the people from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin had split from the other ten tribes at the time of Solomon, when Solomon was the king. Now, when Yahshua spoke to her, she was kind of surprised about that. And so Yahshua began to tell her things, and uh, eventually he gets her to the point where he's talking about worshiping Yahweh. So let's start there at 423. I'm going to pick up at 22. 22, thank you. You worship, you know not what. We know that what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, let's, the just, let's just stop. Okay, just let's just stop right. Okay, finish that one point, uh, uh, Mike. That you're for the reading. Father's seeketh. Okay, for the Father's seeketh such to worship him. All right. Now, what Mike just read is that Yahshua said that Yahweh seeks those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, the very statement obviously shows you that just because somebody's worshiping God does not mean that they're worshiping him in the way that he wants to be worshiped. Now, I've had people tell me many times over the years, well, I worship God in my own way. Well, that may be true that you worship God in your own way, but that does not mean that Yahweh is accepting that worship or honored by it. The worship that Yahweh requires, that he, that he seeks, is that we worship him in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Keep reading the next verse, please. Yahweh is spirit, and they that worship him what must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, let's just take that point right there. Now, he said that Yahweh is spirit. Now, some Bibles will read that God is a spirit. Now, that is not actually correct. It should be that God or Yahweh is spirit. He's not a spirit. In other words, here's Yahweh or God over here, and there's another spirit to the right or left of him. Yahweh is spirit. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything that exists. He's all the spirit that there is. Now, if you go to your priest, ask him this question. What is spirit? Now, when I first came into this class, I went down to the church, went to the rectory, talked to the priest and said, now, in the Bible, it says God is spirit. What is spirit? The priest said to me, well, spirit is God. I said, oh, okay. Well, then what is God? 
He's a God of spirit. Now, what that is really is that uh, you're uh, avoiding answering the question. Because what you have, there's a dog chasing his tail. I'm not getting the, uh, uh, not getting the, an the question answered that I'm seeking. I want to know what exactly is spirit. Now, the bottom line is they don't know what spirit is. And the reality is that our founder, who was also an assistant pastor of a church and uh, uh, had uh, uh, this occurrence that happened to him in the year of 1931, where he received a divine vision and revelation. It was actually claimed that he was caught right up into eternity. Now, what he was shown to him and reveals that Yahweh exists in a state that is incomprehensible or inscrutable that no man has ever seen. And that that state is infinite and eternal. It doesn't have any limits or boundaries. In other words, there's not a point where spirit all of a sudden stops and there's something else. Yahweh is what they refer to as the all in all. He's all things that exist and there is nothing but him. And that those are coming right out of the Bible over in Isaiah. That I am Yahweh, there is none else. And listen, the bottom line is this. That that spirit actually is defined down through the scriptures once you are made aware of it. Now what spirit is, spirit is divine attributes. And these attributes that define Yahweh or what he is in spirit are these nine things. Intelligence, knowledge, wisdom, love, beauty, justice, and foundation, power, and strength. Now, there are sub-attributes that branch off from there, but those are the nine primary attributes. Now, what I want you to know is that Yahweh doesn't possess intelligence. He is intelligence itself. Yahweh doesn't have knowledge. He is knowledge. Yahweh doesn't have love. He is love. He's the very essence or substance of each one of those things. Now, let me explain this also going forward. You don't know what knowledge looks like. You can't sit down and draw me a picture of knowledge. You can draw an example or a manifestation of it, but you don't know what knowledge is unless it is manifested. It's the same thing with love. You wouldn't be able to draw a picture of what love is. I'm talking about the very essence of it. You only know love through the experience of it being manifested. Now, Yahweh in these, this state is infinite intelligence and infinite wisdom and infinite love and knowledge. And what he desired to do was to define those things by manifesting them. And that's what we read about in Romans 119, where it says, That which may be known of Yahweh is manifest in them, for Yahweh has showed it unto them. Yahweh decided to manifest his divine attributes so that the world might understand something about him in that state that they cannot perceive, nor can they scrutinize it, nor can they get outside to turn around and look back at it and, and describe it. He is showing forth what he is in his essence of existence by manifesting through this form that the, uh, right now we have the uh, cursor moving up and down, that Eloistic form that appeared to Moses and the prophets in visions and revelations that demonstrated these attributes. Now, right back in your Bible, in the law or in the prophets, you read that in the law, let me just uh, give you an example of the law since we're talking about law and prophets. When Yahweh Elohim told Moses to have that tabernacle constructed and build one out there in the wilderness of Sinai. Now here's what Yahweh Elohim did. He chose out two men. Moses didn't choose them. Yahweh himself chose these men and filled them with the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of of wisdom and understanding so that they would be able to correctly build what Moses was going to describe to them. Now, they refer to those things as being spirit. Now, if you go over into the books of the prophets, you'll also find where it defines him as being uh, the spirit of these very things that I mentioned to you. 
Uh, and, and this is where we try to get people to understand that the whole purpose boils down to this, that Yahweh desired to bring forth creatures or offspring and then make himself known in part to his creatures. Now, knowing that nobody could ever know the totality of Yahweh because there is no ending uh, of what Yahweh really is, he decided to condense himself in a lesser state that he might manifest some fundamental uh, aspects of his own nature and spirit so that we might know something about him. Now, in doing that, in order to do that, what he did, he masterminded in that state of pure spirit an entire purpose and plan. Uh, run over one of the readers, please, and get me Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am Yahweh and there is none else. I am Yahweh and there is none like me. Mm -hmm. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, here's what Yahweh's doing. He's doing all of his pleasure, and he declared the end right from the beginning, meaning that this purpose had a outcome that would not be altered, would not be uh, able to be uh, uh, changed or stopped or, or whatever you want to say. Uh, this end was uh, uh, going to be accomplished. And Yahweh's end obviously, is what he has to get us to. When you Look, when you go and read a book and somebody writes a novel, what they have is an end in mind when they start out of what they want to bring you down through the story to bring you to the conclusion or the end and that you might understand why that end is so spectacular by all of the elements that they put in the novel that bring you down to who is the hero and who is the bad guy and what intention did they have in being uh, either good or bad. All of that is defined in your novel. Now, history, ladies and gentlemen, broken down is his story. This is Yahweh's story about himself. And he orchestrated an entire purpose and plan by which he would lay out elements of what his intentions were, and he would eventually bring those things all together for you to reveal to you mysteries and open up an understanding of him of how he actually is and truthfully exists. Everything that exists is under the control of Yahweh, the Father, in pure spirit. Yahweh is not, con this is contrary to most, uh, almost all religions. God is not sitting back passively letting man do whatever he wants to do, and he's hoping that things will work out so he can accomplish his purpose. That's not what Yahweh's doing. He brought it all into existence. Everything that exists is Yahweh. He is the source, substance, limits, and bounds of all things that exist. We were all taught, well, I won't say we all, all of us Catholics were taught, well, I know the Lutherans as well, were taught that God made everything from nothing. Now, that is not in the Bible. What Yahweh did is he created everything from the substance of spirit. Spirit, but whether you understand this or not, is substance. It's substantive. And the substance that we could liken spirit unto would be energy. Now, in uh, the great works of some of the great scientists, such as Albert Einstein, Einstein showed that matter or mass is a, a, a concentration of energy. That energy is the source of all mass or all matter in the universe. Now, energy is not something you can look at and say, well, this is the shape of energy. It's square or it's round or whatever. Energy is an invisible force that can bring forth something that is tangible and actually seen. Now, let me show you an example of that. Uh, get me, oh, You're on the chart that I want. Now, when we talk about Yahweh not being a Trinitarian being, let me show you how Yahweh created in the creation example of that. Now we have, all of us have and exist on this earth in an atmosphere 
that is invisible to us of H2O. H2O is the molecular structure of water. And water can exist in three states. It can be a gas, which is in your room and surrounds you right now. It can condense and become a liquid or an intermediate state that can be seen. It can actually take on the shape of whatever uh, bottle or whatever you put it in. And it can then become solid or become ice. But here's the important thing to understand. We have three states of water or H2O, but whether it's gas, whether it's liquid, or whether it's solid, it's still H2O. It is not three separate substances. It's through, it's uh, one substance, which is the gas of H2O, in two manifestations, a liquid state and a solid state. Now, Yahweh is spirit. Elohim is the spirit of Yahweh operating in his purpose in a lesser state. And Yahshua is that same spirit manifested in a physical body or become fleshly. It's not three separate things or three separate people. Now, getting back to the purpose, I want to go back to the chart and get back on this purpose. Now, listen, Yahweh in that state When he sets up everything in the creation, all things that exist are manifesting him in some principle and in some uh, uh, aspect of how he actually exists. Now, what he did is he set this purpose up, and when he set the purpose up, he set it up so that everything that occurred all the way from the Garden of Eden all the way down to, to today is under his control and it's happening as he has willed it to occur because every part of it brings is going to bring us to the final conclusion of what Yahweh wants us to know about himself. So let's go back to what Andy was talking about. Let's go back to uh, the Moses chart, please. Now, when this covenant was set up at Mount Sinai, this covenant was natural and physical works of f- forms of worship. You did things such as, uh, you know, they did things like they had uh, uh, ceremonials and days and suppers that were all part of this, that were fleshly in, in nature. In other words, when they had the Passover supper, they had to eat a lamb that was offered up. They had to eat unleavened bread and so on. They had to build this tabernacle, and in the tabernacle there was a day of atonement that occurred, and the high priest made atonement for sin by offering a sacrifice and putting it on this altar. Uh, Get the tabernacle pattern. Now, this tabernacle is a manifestation that Yahweh is manifesting how his purpose is constructed and how it operates. Now, uh, over in Acts of the Apostles, uh, 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 744. Somebody run over and get Acts 744 for a minute. Acts 744. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking now, unto Moses that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. Now, this is this is Stephen. Uh, one of the disciples that was uh, stoned to death because he was a follower of Yahshua. This was after the day of Pentecost, uh, after Yahshua's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. Now, Stephen was, uh, before they stoned him, he gave this testimony, and he talked about the tabernacle being a tabernacle of witness. Now, if you look at the tabernacle, there's three parts of it. There's a most holy place, there's a holy place, and there's a court roundabout. Those three parts are one tabernacle. They're not three separate buildings, but they are three breakdowns or aspects of this tabernacle pattern. Now, you also are threefold. You have a head cavity or cranial cavity. You have a chest region or a thoracic cavity. And then you also have an abdominal cavity, which is where your intestines are, your kidneys, and so on. There's three parts of you, but that's one body. Now, everything is threefold in nature because Yahweh is the father, pure spirit. He's also the Elohistic form, which is an offspring of pure spirit, referred to as the son. And then there is Yahshua, who also is a part of that uh, uh, that 
that pattern, and he is actually the Holy Spirit, which we'll get into another time. But what I want you to see is that Yahweh is demonstrating his own makeup by the tabernacle. And each structure, there was different functions that had to be performed. And one of these times we'll get in and show you how the tabernacle explains why everything happened in the, in, the, in, the ta in the Bible the way that it did. We'll go into that and explain that and show you how it follows the setup of this pattern and the operation within it. Now, what I'm trying to get you to see is Yahweh decided to go down through time, go back over again to the Moses chart. Uh, what he did is he set up everything to be a natural physical, what we call example or manifestation, or what we often refer to as a type and a shadow. These things that Yahweh set up with the Jews, these forms of worship, were not what he ultimately is looking for in terms of being worship. They were manifestations that later would be understood and revealed after such time that the Messiah would come in to be the Savior of the world. Now, well, that's a, that's a uh, crucial part of this whole uh, purpose of Yahweh and how it works. Now, Yahweh is running everything from Adam all the way down, all the way down through even to tonight. And I want you to know that when Adam was created, Yahweh did not say to Adam, Yahweh Elohim did not say, Adam, you see this tree over here? We'll call it the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, don't eat it because if you do, you'll die. That's not what he said. He said, Adam, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, do not touch it or eat it because in the day that you do eat it, you will surely die. He didn't say if you eat it. He said, in the day you eat it, you're going to die. Now, Yahweh set that up, and there was a, for, a, no, it was a foregone conclusion that Adam would partake of that uh, 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 tree, and therefore, by that man, sin entered into the world. Now, I want you to know that, and Paul talks about that in Romans, the fifth chapter, how by one man, sin entered into the world. Now, what I want you to understand is that Yahweh purpose that for Adam to eat of that tree. Now, how he did it, how he caused him to do it, is it also says in the Bible that Adam was not deceived by Lucifer. It was the woman that was deceived. But Adam had, when Yahweh created Adam, he created him with a soul, and that soul he put in there a love for his bride. And he was instinctively had that love for his bride when she was brought forth. And Adam ate that fruit willingly when his bride handed it to him, knowing that they were going to die because Yahweh Elohim had told him that, but he did it to die with his bride, or that is to say because he loved his bride. He laid down his life for her. Now, what I want you to see is this is an example in the law because uh, Andy talked about how that, uh, and also Chuck, I want to say, talked about how Israel was the bride of Yahweh Elohim. Well, Yahweh Elohim knew right at that mountain when he gave them that law that they would not be able to keep it. Moses chart, please. You say, well, how do you know he knew that? Well, let me show you this. When Moses went up into the mountain, he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what he was shown while he was in that mountain, other than also the Genesis that you read about, the creation that he writes about in the first two chapters of Genesis, but he was shown that structure of the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, when it was constructed, became a building or a vessel by which people, when they sinned, could be forgiven for their sins by uh, a lamb being offered for them, and then the priest going in and making an atonement for them. Now, Yahweh set that up before the people even worshiped the golden calf. In other words, Yahweh knew they were going to do this, that they were going to eat, worship that calf and be disobedient and also not be able to keep those laws. And as it was pointed out tonight, it's not good enough to, to keep 99% of them. You have to keep 100% to establish righteousness, and nobody could do it. Every one of them, the Bible says every one of them uh, uh, came short of, the, uh, of righteousness. Uh, they all sinned, and they were all without sin. And it says in there, our righteousness was as filthy rags. Now, Yahweh knew they couldn't keep it. 
and Andy talked about this too, that Yahweh said over in the book of Deuteronomy, oh, that there was such a heart in the people, and Chuck talked about that heart too, that it was in the shape of the heart, oh, that there was such a heart in the people that they would uh, love me and keep my commandments. Well, why wasn't there a heart in them to do that? Because that only way you can have that heart is if Yahweh puts that within you. And he didn't put it in the people back then, so he knew that none of them would be able to keep that uh, commandment or those laws, that all of them would sin. He knew that Adam, he set it up so that Adam also would eat that fruit and be disobedient. Now, why would he do that? Because his whole point was to come in himself in that body that we call Yahshua the Messiah, the world calls him Jesus Christ, that was Yahweh manifested in that body, coming down to die for his bride and for mankind, to lay down his life, to show forth his great kindness and mercy because he was without sin. He didn't deserve to be crucified, but he did it so that he could offer himself as an atonement to Yahweh, and then Yahweh would accept him as that sacrificial offering that makes the, the just for the unjust, the one that had not sinned, he was worthy then of then becoming the ransom by which he paid so that Yahweh would then forgive those people and be and reconcile them back to himself. So Yahweh had intended right from the beginning to put a savior into the world before the world was created. Now listen, Go over there, Revelation, and get me the lamb slain. I, I want to say it's the 13th chapter, if I'm not mistaken, of, of Revelation, or the 12th, one of the two. 13 and 8. Thank you. Revelation's 13 and 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, the lamb slain, from the foundation of the world. Now, Yahshua the Messiah was the lamb that John the Baptist pointed him out and said, Behold the lamb of Yahweh that cometh to take away the sins of the world. Now, John the Revelator in the book of Revelation refers to him as the lamb slain before the foundations of the world, which means that he was already prepared to be a sacrifice once he created mankind, that he would be a sacrifice by which they would be redeemed and uh, reconciled and atoned for. Yahweh set that lamb up or set up that, uh, that, that uh, atonement so that Yahshua the Messiah becomes preeminent over all creatures. In other words, Yahweh doesn't just plan on having a savior. He has to have people that need to be saved now, what if everybody chose not to be disobedient and Yahshua from the foundation of the world was set, his purpose was to come in and be offered as a sacrifice to show forth his kindness and mercy towards mankind. If nobody sinned, then Yahweh would have created a, a savior for uh, no purpose because he wouldn't have a job. But Yahweh sets it up so that every person, every creature needs a savior. That way, Yahshua becomes the focal point by which salvation is going to be ministered and for us to recognize that all of us have no righteousness except that Yahshua uh, makes an atonement for us and then puts his spirit right within us. Now, I only got uh, less than five minutes, about five minutes left. So what I want you to see is this. Yahweh has orchestrated this whole thing. So everything you see happening down through the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, is Yahweh setting up one example after the next, manifesting salvation, manifesting deliverance, manifesting mercy. All of this is being demonstrated down through the Bible as Yahweh sets up Israel as being his bride and time and time again comes in and uh, forgives her and uh, 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 saves her from, from destruction, even though she was sinning, even though she was continuously breaking the covenant that she had made from Mount Sinai. Now, let me take all that and fast forward. When the Messiah came in, everything was already set up right from Adam down to the time he came into the world. When the Messiah came in, he did not come in to institute a form of worship. That form of worship was already explained to you by Andy, that it was already set up. 
He came in because that law and all that form of worship was not what Yahweh wanted, how Yahweh wanted man to worship him. He has to end that law and fulfill it. That means finish it. Now, in the Bible, in Matthew, in Luke, in John, Yahshua talks about how he came to fulfill and to finish something. Now, our founder used to make this challenge. He used to say, if anybody can show me where Christ ever said in either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John that he came to start something, he said, I'll eat your Bible. I'll eat your Bible. I'll eat my Bible, whatever you want. You just go ahead and try to find a place where Yahshua said he came to start something. Now you say, well, what do you mean by that? We were taught that Jesus Christ came in to institute the sacraments and forms of worship. The word institute means to set up, to start, or begin. Now the Messiah said, no. He said, I came to fulfill and in John, he talks about he came that what bears witness of him is the works that he came to finish that the Father gave him. Now, what's the difference between institute and fulfill is that they're exact opposites. Institute means to set up and begin and start, and fulfill means to end or finish and bring to uh, its desired uh, conclusion. Now, that's exactly what he came in to do. So his ministry and his life all the way up through his death, burial, resurrection, was to fulfill what was written in the scriptures to be the, uh, the scriptures were as witnesses pointing him out. So he told them to search the scriptures because they testify of me. Now that gets me to the point about how we worship in truth. Truth isn't what you want to believe. Truth isn't what you like. Truth is what you can prove with evidence and witnesses that support it. Now, the Messiah claimed to be, when he was walking around, I am the one, I'm the Messiah. Did you know there were many others that had come to Israel before him and claimed to be the Messiah? How do they know which one is the true Messiah? He's not the only one that came, started preaching things and saying, I'm the Messiah. Follow me. But here's the difference. Yahshua told them, don't take my word on it, search the scriptures because the scriptures are testifying of me. Every single thing that Yahshua did, his entire life from the time he was born to the time of his resurrection and ascension was already prophesied and written about in the Law and the Prophets. So his biography was written before he was born. Everything he did was in fulfillment of the scriptures. Now, the new covenant began on the day of Pentecost. That really would be, as you would say, the New Testament. Now, the problem is that the New Testament, according to what Paul says, is not written with pen and ink, but it's written in the fleshly tables of the heart by the living Spirit or Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to know that these things I'm throwing out have a lot of, uh, we have a lot more that we can put together for you, but I'm fighting time, so I'm throwing things out. But I want you to know this that everything that they are telling you as to how to worship God, whether it be the Catholicism, the Baptists, the Jehovah Witnesses, the Jews, is all part of the Old Covenant. The stuff that the Catholics done, I found out after coming in there, many of their uh, feast days and ceremonies came right out of the law or out of Judaism. They were the same thing that the Jews did. The Jews tried to keep all those, and not one of them found any righteousness. And what's happened is it's been dragged over past this cross into the new covenant and set up again. Now, it didn't uh, give the people righteousness back then, and it's not going to give you righteousness now. And Paul went to the Jews in Romans, the 10th chapter. This is what he said. He said, my heart desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness of Yahweh, have gone about to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness which is of faith. Now, this is a mouthful, but I want you to know there was no righteousness back there from Adam all the way down to the Messiah. Every one of them died, went to the grave, and had to wait for Yahshua to atone for their sins in order for them then to become, as it were, acceptable to Yahweh. Now, under the new covenant, the new covenant is not like the old covenant. The old covenant, they had to do things to try to be righteous. Under the new covenant, here's how it works. 
He promised in Ezekiel that I will put my spirit in you. Please get that. Give me a couple extra minutes. Get Ezekiel 36, 24, please. I'll finish this up quick. Ezekiel 36, 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put now within watch. you. Now watch. Remember under the old covenant, he said, oh, that there was such a heart in them. Under the new covenant, he's going to put that heart in us now. He's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit. Now, the only way that we can worship Yahweh in spirit and truth is to have his Holy Spirit manifested in us and to have the heart that is acceptable and able to receive correction, chastisement, and the love of the truth. Now, that I said a lot, but I want you to know that that's what we're under now. We're under a new covenant that is not by works that you perform to obtain righteousness. Paul said we are now under grace. Grace means unmerited reward. You can't earn it. It's given to you as a free gift from your creator. And that grace is what causes you that. And you can't earn grace either. Grace means you don't earn it. It means unmerited reward. And it's by grace we're saved and not of ourselves. I hope you got something out of that. I thank you for coming tonight and being attentive. I hope it edifies you and gives you cause to sit and think about some of these things. And please return and we'll teach you more. With that, I'll hand it back to the moderator. Peace in Yahshua. Thank you so much, Dr. Dennis Volpe. And I thank everybody for attending our Green Bay Zoom class. We hold Zoom classes every Tuesday from 7 p.m. till 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. We also have our in-person class every Friday from 7 till 9 p.m. And that's at our Velp Avenue location. We look forward to seeing you again. I will be dismissing everybody with a doxology taken from the last uh, two books of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let's all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.